second talk. Yeah, our second talk is very interesting. It's Professor Michael Hellcats. Everyone, uh, already know him. He just not deliver you know very nice conversation on the panel discussions. Actually, he's a very famous young scientist worldwide. Right, you win many titles. Uh, after you graduated from uh, Harvard, uh, about ten or twelve years to now, so you win uh thirty and thirty right Forbes, and uh, you win another title was twenty and forty. The young scientists, <laughs> yeah, all these big uh, kind of titles or honors, yeah, and uh, done so many interesting work. And uh, today we go to hear your story for the uh engineer and the measurement of a thermal radiation. It sounds something like uh, you know with the space, right? Astronomy. Yeah. Okay. Stage is yours. Word is yours, please. Uh thank you so much, Alice. Uh, let me share my screen one second. Um can you see my screen okay? I Perfect. Yeah, so th thank you so much, Alice, for that uh, very gracious introduction. It's really wonderful to, uh, uh, to be here with all of you. Um, so uh, my talk is about engineering and measurement of thermal radiation. Uh, but before I get started on that, um, let me make sure that my clicker works. Uh, before I get started on that, I wanted to just introduce uh, my research group at UW-Madison. So um, I've been at UW-Madison for about six years, um, and I've been fortunate to work with a lot of wonderful people. Um, here are some uh, photos that were kind of pre-pandemic for uh, from some of our various group meetups. Of course, the group is not actually this big. Um, these are uh, some of our group, but also uh, some significant others and, and uh, collaborators and so forth. So the group right now now is about 10 people. Um, of course, in the last year, uh, it's been quite difficult, um, especially, uh, you know, uh, with everybody kind of stuck at home, um, uh, more or less. And so this is what the group looks like for the last uh, nine months or so. And fortunately, we've been able to uh, keep up research uh, reasonably well, and also, of course, keep up with each other with all of these great uh, kind of teleconferencing tools that we have now. Um, so uh, my group uh, works on quite a few different areas, actually, um, something that we didn't discuss during the panel discussion, but um, that I think is worth uh, thinking about for anybody who is starting any sort of kind of group leader type position, whether in uh, in a lab or in academia or, um, or at, a, at a corporate lab, um, is uh, how big is your focus going to be? How broad is your focus going to be? So in my case, I think um, the group group is actually a little bit too broad, which causes some potential issues. Um, but also, it's very intellectually exciting. And so that's why um, I try to, uh, uh, I'm able to, uh, that's why I want to kind of keep the group at this level of scope. So we do work with optics and photonics uh, from the visible all the way to the mid infrared spectral range. We do a lot of work with new and emerging optical materials. And then that becomes kind of an enabling technology for a lot of uh, applied research and engineering type research in vision engineering. So the engineering of, uh, of human vision and related applications, shaping light with nanostructures, which includes things like metamaterials and metasurface surfaces and, um, and optical coatings, things related to what Yuan Mu talked about um, just uh, half an hour ago. Uh, and then also thermal emission engineering and metrology, which is going to be the topic of, uh, of today's talk. So uh, before I, uh, I talk about any of the research, I wanted to uh, thank uh, a lot of people that contributed to the results presented in this talk. So these are contributors from our research group at UW-Madison, from other folks at UW-Madison, and also external collaborators um, at Purdue, at the University of Vienna, and at the Naval Research Lab, um, especially. And the uh, the folks that are highlighted in bold are um, the ones that contributed the most to the results in this talk. And I want to highlight in particular uh, Dr. Yuja Xiao, who is a uh, research associate in my group right now and is on the faculty job market. He did uh, a lot of the, uh, he led a lot of the work that I'm going to present in this talk today. So he could easily be giving the same uh, talk that I'm giving today. And so if you're looking for a new faculty at your university, um, I would uh, not miss the opportunity to recruit, uh, to recruit Yuja to your university. <laughs> 
So here's the outline for the research talk. Um, first, I'm going to give a kind of a refresher on what thermal radiation is, and then talk about uh, some experimental challenges that we faced early on uh, in, uh, in my group on precision measurements of thermal radiation. Um, this will give you just a flavor of the kind of experimental challenges we have to uh, overcome in our group, uh, and I think is uh, kind of interesting as a, as a process point. Then I'm going to talk about a couple new techniques that we developed based on the ability to do these precision measurements. Uh, one of them is called, uh, we, we call it depth thermography, which is the uh, a technique that enables the measurement of temperature beneath the surfaces of materials using infrared thermal radiation. And then another one called, which we call Planck spectroscopy, which is uh, the ability to do spectroscopy without using a spectrometer. So if you're curious um, how that works, please stick around until at least uh, the middle of the talk. And then I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the engineering of thermal radiation and thermal radiators. Um, so in particular, I want to spend some time talking about temperature tunable optical materials that give you the ability to engineer thermal radiation in interesting ways. In particular, we uh, work with uh, complex oxides and complex nickelates that have insulator to metal phase transitions and therefore have substantial tunability with temperature. Uh, I'm going to show you how uh, Using this uh, this platform, we're able to make zero differential thermal emitters or thermal radiators, which are essentially surface coatings that, irrespective of their temperature, they emit the same amount of thermal radiation, and that's very very exciting because it uh, feels uh, kind of naively uh, to uh, to be thermodynamically impossible, but of course it's perfectly possible and falls within existing laws of thermodynamics as everything should. And then finally, I'm going to conclude by showing you the fastest ever temporal controlled of emissivity, which gives us the ability to make um, optical pulses uh, using a technique that's quite different from, for example, conventional nonlinear optical techniques. Okay, so first a refresher on thermal radiation or black body radiation. In general, the spectrum and intensity of thermal radiation that's emitted by a black body is given by Planck's law, which is uh, this law over here, which can be integrated to yield the famous Stefan Boltzmann law that says that the uh, higher the temperature uh, of your object, the more thermally emitted light is going to be uh, given off. And that relationship is just the thermally emitted intensity or the thermally emitted power uh, is uh, directly proportional to temperature to the fourth when the temperature is in absolute units. So Kelvin or uh, Rankine. Thermal radiation is very important as a scientific concept. It's responsible for the vast majority of light in the universe. So light from a fire, or light from uh, stars is uh, generally uh, thermal radiation. And it's also important to the history of science. In fact, our fundamental understanding, really the theoretical underpinnings that today back up Planck's law were really the first um, great success of quantum theory. So kind of the birth of quantum mechanics as a field uh, was closely related to our understanding of thermal radiation. So if you uh, look at Planck's law and you plot it, you plot the spectral radiance versus the wavelength versus the temperature, you see that the hotter an object is, the more light it gives off, or in this case, the hotter a black body is, the more light it gives off. And also the spectrum shifts um, as the temperature increases. So as the temperature gets hotter and hotter, a black body is going to emit more and more at shorter and shorter wavelengths. So uh, at kind of room temperature, most objects emit primarily in the mid infrared, whereas if you get up to very high temperatures, thousands of degrees, uh, uh, the peak of thermal emission is going to be in the, the, the visible, and that's why, of course, the sun has a lot of energy in the UV, the visible, and the near-infrared. And so this relationship that hotter objects give off more light is going to be very important to, uh, to uh, many elements of this talk, and I'm going to show you by the end of it how we can overcome that relationship as well. So. Um, all hotter objects, generally speaking, emit more light unless you engineer them uh, in, a, in a very unique way. And so for a black body, you have this Stefan Boltzmann relationship uh, where the uh, uh, the relationship between power and temperature to the fourth is just this Stefan Boltzmann constant. For a real object, you also have this extra term over here, which um, we're going to refer to as the total emissivity or the integrated emissivity, which is a number between zero and one that tells you the propensity of real objects to emit. So if an object is close to being a black body, this emissivity is going to be close to one. If the object doesn't uh, emit uh, light very efficiently as thermal radiation, this uh, emissivity is going to be very close to zero. And um, irrespective of whether you have a black body or a real object and whether you're, you're looking at the whole spectral range and you're integrating uh, 
the uh, Planck's law or over the all of wavelengths, or you're only integrating it over certain uh, relevant wavelengths, you always have this one-to-one -one mapping between temperature and thermal uh, thermally emitted power, and it's generally speaking going to be increasing. So as the temperature increases, the black body radiance is going to increase. Uh, also, the radiance of any sort of real object is going to increase. And so this is the fundamental principle that um, uh, enables, for example, infrared imaging. So if you have, let's say, a wall or some object that has some temperature gradient, some spatial temperature gradient, where the temperatures are hotter uh, are higher on the inside and lower on the outside, that's going to be immediately mapped to a thermal power gradient, again, as a function of position. And this is what enables various uh, types of uh, infrared and thermal imaging. Just to give you an example, um, our, our family dog, Toby, uh, we, who we uh, rescued uh, two years ago um, from, uh, uh, from Alabama. He was a stray dog in Birmingham, Alabama. Here is our infrared images of Toby. And you can see that, uh, that uh, his nose, which is cold, dogs' noses are cold because of evaporative cooling. They lick their nose and then the water evaporates and the evaporative cooling cools down their nose. So you can see that their nose, the nose is essentially at room temperature. It's giving off a lot less thermal radiation. And so the infrared camera can convert that to a temperature, whereas right around the eyes where you have a higher temperature and the emissivity um, is, uh, the emissivity kind of everywhere is similar, but the temperature is higher uh, because you don't have kind of fur covering, covering the dog. And therefore you have more thermal radiation and you're seeing of course, higher temperature readout from the infrared camera. So what the infrared camera is doing is it's not reading out the temperature inside the dog, it's reading out the surface temperature. So if the fur is colder, then you're only seeing the temperature uh, of the fur of the dog. And so we'll talk about later in this talk about how we can modify uh, infrared thermometry to be able to see deep inside uh, uh, certain types of materials. Okay, so let's talk about the opportunities for engineering of thermal radiation. So uh, the spectrum of thermal radiation is of course given by this Planck's law, but it also has this emissivity correction, this number between zero and one. And this number between zero and one here, this emissivity is really an optical property of the object with many degrees of freedom. In particular, it can depend on wavelength, but I have an ellipses over here, um, it can, which indicates that it can also depend on things like direction and polarization and temperature and applied field and so forth. Forth. So you can have an object which is very emissive at one wavelength, but not very emissive at another one. You could have a different object which has very emissive in a certain direction or with a certain polarization, but for the other polarization, it's not very emissive at all. And in general, the emissivity of an object is equal to its optical absorptivity. This is an equality that's given by some fundamental laws of thermo thermodynamics, and it's um, also often uh, called a Kirchhoff's law of thermal radiation. Now, in some instances, uh, this uh, emissivity can also be undefined. Generally speaking, if your emitter is not in some sort of thermal equilibrium, but most of the time, Kirchhoff's law of thermal radiation can be directly applied. And this is why uh, somebody who does optics like me um, can uh, easily get into the field of thermal radiation because essentially the ability to engineer thermal radiation is equivalent to the ability to engineer optical absorption. And therefore we can use the entire toolkit of optics. So thin film interference optics, we can use optical metasurfaces and frequency selective surfaces and all sorts of methods that we uh, that we can use to engineer optical absorption can also be engineered, uh, can also be uh, used to engineer thermal radiation. Now, because uh, this is potentially an important and exciting avenue for research, and in particular because this emissivity can in some cases be undefined, and I'll show you some of these cases later on in this talk, we have a need for an experimental capability to measure thermal radiation uh, very, very well. And so that would be useful for material characterization, but also for applications like thermoregulation and infrared kind of camouflage and privacy and lots of others. And so I want to talk about kind of this experimental capability and what it means to be able to measure uh, thermal radiation. So um, I'm an optics experimentalist. Um, and so uh, you would think that for an optics experimentalist, measuring thermal radiation would be a pretty easy thing. So conceptually, all you might do is you might take your sample and maybe you also have a reference and you mount it on a temperature controlled stage so you can change its temperature. And then you just use some optics, some lenses or some uh, some mirrors or something like that to uh, couple the light that, that is uh, emitted into a spectrometer and you measure the spectrum. And maybe you can put some polarizers in between or you can tilt the sample so you can do angle dependent measurements and then you're done. And so in our lab, we have this Fourier transform infrared spectrometer connected to an optical microscope, which means we can look 
at very small samples and we can measure thermal radiation from small samples. We have a stage that goes up to very high temperatures and also very low temperatures. And so that's very useful. We can change the, uh, the angle of the, uh, of the sample so we can look at angle dependent thermal radiation and life should be really good. Um, it turns out that it's not actually that simple, and um, it actually took us uh, when I when I joined UW Madison and started getting these experiments set up. It took us, you know, something like a year and a half or two years to be able to get good, easily understandable thermal uh, thermal radiation measurements. And uh, an important reason for that is that the data analysis of your measurements has to account for not only the thermal radiation from the sample, but also the thermal radiation from everything else. Everything is thermally radiating. The detector is thermally radiating, the, the uh, different parts of the instrument are thermally radiating, the walls of your lab, if you're standing next to it, you're thermally radiating. And so you have to account for all of that in an intelligent way. And also you have to account for the frequency dependent response of your instrument, because of course your detector doesn't have infinite bandwidth, your optics don't have infinite bandwidth and so forth. It's also surprisingly non-trivial to obtain and characterize a good reference. So you might imagine that getting a, an object which is like a black body is very simple, but it's actually uh, in certain instances quite difficult. So what we use in our lab is uh, a wafer with a, a carbon nanotube, kind of a carbon nanotube forest, so vertically oriented carbon nanotubes that are long enough um, that such that they absorb a lot of the incident light and don't scatter or reflect a lot of light. But this is quite challenging because these samples aren't necessarily very robust. Um, most other samples can have temperature dependencies, which are potentially a problem. So even obtaining and characterizing a good reference is potentially uh, challenging. So there are a lot of these experimental difficulties that have to be overcome. So um, I want to show you an example of some of these experimental difficulties. This was a very amusing problem that we, uh, that we found in our lab that took us a long time to overcome. So our sample is this one of these carbon nanotube forests. So it's essentially it's a laboratory black body. And all we're doing here is we're just putting that on a temperature controller and sending the output into a Fourier transform spectrometer and just measuring a spectrum of uh, thermally emitted light. So here is a measured spectrum. I'm uh, plotting the kind of the spectral intensity in arbitrary units because here we're not comparing to any reference. And so this, uh, the spectrum also includes things like the detector responsivity. So there's almost nothing beyond 17 microns, but that's just because our detector doesn't work out at 17 microns. And so um, here is the spectral intensity versus wavelength at a sample, uh, uh, which is at 30 degrees Celsius. And so, uh, sorry that I have this over here. This is, uh, uh, this uh, comes next, but if you decrease the temperature, your spectral intensity goes down, which is what you expect, right? Hotter objects emit more light, colder objects emit less light, so this is totally normal. You keep going down the temperature, 24 degrees, 23 degrees, 22 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius, everything is totally normal and fine, but if you keep going, something really strange happens. Here's the data at 20 degrees, 19 degrees, 18 degrees, 17 degrees, 16 degrees, going all the way down to 10 degrees Celsius. And all of a sudden your spectral intensity starts going back up instead of continuing to go down. This is really bizarre and um, it is just counterintuitive. It really goes against kind of some fundamental laws of thermodynamics. And that's a big, big problem, right? If you, uh, uh, so I remember um, uh, seeing a talk um, a number of years ago when I was still a graduate student by Marlon Scully who was talking uh, about uh, super radiance and, and, uh, and other phenomena. And um, something that he said that really uh, stuck in my head is that uh, if you go into your lab, if you're an experimentalist and you go into your lab and you measure something very carefully and it violates uh, Maxwell's equations in, in some way, then you know potentially that's too bad for Maxwell. But if you go into your lab and you measure something that potentially violates the laws of thermodynamics, that's too bad for you because um, they're, because the, it, it's a very kind of strict set of laws that um, you know, which kind of shatter our understanding of, uh, uh, of the world um, if you uh, find something that violates those laws in any meaningful way. And so this is something that is just wrong um, in some way. And in this case, we're analyzing our data in an inadequate way, but it's very, very complicated. So we tried to figure this situation out. Um, and what we found out um, afterward, and I'll show you kind of how we came to that conclusion, is that we have a non-trivial background in our thermal radiation measurements that's going in the opposite direction in our uh, Fourier transform spectrometer. So here's how this experiment is done. We have a sample, we have a temperature stage. Uh, the sample is tilted for technical reasons, but that doesn't matter too much. We have this Michelson interferometer with a moving mirror. This is what's called a Fourier transform spectrometer or an FTIR. 
and we have a detector over here. But as um, I discussed a little bit earlier, uh, we also have a very large uh, uh, thermal emission background. So that means that not only is the sample emitting, but also, for example, various optics and apertures and things like that in our complicated setup are thermally emitting. And it turns out that the backward emitted background, so for example, if you have some optical components over here and they're emitting light in the backward direction, not in the forward direction, and some of that light hits the interferometer and comes back to the detector, it turns out that that's what contributes to this very strange situation where the, uh, where the detected light goes down and then up again as the temperature is decreased. And so I want to show you a little bit about how that works. So here is how we did some of this analysis. We uh, measured the detector reading, so what the detector is seeing as a function of the mirror position, the position of this mirror in the interferometer. This is actually how a Fourier transform spectrometer acquires spectra. You measure this kind of interferogram, what the detector is reading versus the mirror location, and then you use a mathematical tool, in this case, just a fast Fourier transform, to invert this data and to figure out uh, what the spectrum was of your, uh, uh, the, of of the light that's coming into the FTIR. And what we did here is we measured the interferogram as a function of different temperatures, both um, after, above the temperature of this weird kind of transition point and below. So at 30 degrees and at 10 degrees, you might remember that the signal that we measured was actually quite similar. The spectrum that we measured was at similar intensity at 30 degrees and at 10 degrees, which is very strange. And so, um, uh, we, we see that in the interferogram as well, where the intensity is about the same, but notice that the interferogram is pretty much out of phase looking between 10 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius. And so this was quite interesting that something was going on there. It's kind of a suspicious, uh, suspicious situation. And in particular, because here we have one contribution that's not changing with temperature, and we have another contribution, the thermal radiation from the sample that is changing with sample temperature, we can actually back out the component that's changing with temperature in the component that's not, and that's what we did over here. And so what we found is that the background turned out to be out of phase in the interferogram. This is not the phase of light, it's the interferogram phase um, with the uh, thermal radiation coming from the sample. And so by being able to extract the thermal radiation just from the sample, all of a sudden we were able to recover the expected behavior, which is the colder the object is, the less thermal radiation it gives off. And so it was this complicated interplay between the backward thermal radiation and the forward uh, thermal radiation that was giving us this counterintuitive and just wrong behavior behavior where the, uh, the uh, thermal radiation was not monotonic with the temperature. Um, without going into a lot of details, it turns out that this is actually a very kind of general uh, thing that you will encounter in any Fourier transform spectrometer. So if you make some very simple assumptions that are uh, very reasonable about most Fourier transform spectrometers, and you notice that if you have forward emitting sources and backward emitting sources in your setup, you're going to find that what your detector is measuring is always going to be somehow the difference between the intensities of your forward source and your backward source. And so when the uh, power of your forward source and the power of your backward source are about the same, which happens when the sample is close to room temperature because this uh, backward emitting background is a source at room temperature necessarily, then you have this minimum in your thermal emission measurements. And it's this understanding that enables a calibration of the instrument so that you can get actual physically meaningful measurements of your thermal radiation. So that's just an example of some of the experimental challenges that you have to overcome when doing this work. But when all is said and done, we can now do uh, very good thermal radiation measurements, both with high precision and high accuracy, even down to low temperatures. And so that's very exciting, especially for objects, uh, if we have to characterize objects with temperature dependent emissivity, which we're going to do later in this talk, and also for cases when the emissivity is not very well defined, which we'll uh, talk about as well. So here's just an example of one of these thermal radiation measurements. Here's the emissivity at uh, an emission angle of 10 degrees on polarized versus wavelength of just a reference sample that we used, which is just a wafer, a few silica, just really just a piece of glass. And you can see the direct emission measurement that we do when taking into account for all of this calibration uh, that, uh, that uh, we have to do. And you have this, uh, this green curve over here. And then if you look at the black curve, the black curve is we did some ellipsometry measurements on this wafer. It was flat, so we were able to do very good ellips spectroscopic ellipsometry measurements and uh, applied Kirchhoff's law. And you can see that these two curves fall exactly on top of each other. So we have very, very high precision and accuracy, even at relatively low temperatures. So we can get this kind of agreement down to you know, something like 30 degrees Celsius for our emitter, which is uh, we were very, very happy with. 
Um, in, in fact, uh, we were uh, we spent a lot of time doing this kind of calibration and figuring out what the best methods were to do uh, these thermal emission measurements. And so, if you're ever interested in uh, doing these kind of measurements yourself and you're not sure how to start get started with uh, solving some of these challenges, we recently wrote up detailed instructions for how to do measurements in all sorts of situations and even have this nice flow chart. Uh, you know, is your sample in equilibrium or not? Do you have negligible background or not? And so forth. And we came up with methods that are kind of the simplest method that you need in each one of these situations. And that was published in Laser and Photonics Reviews uh, just in 2020. So feel free to check that out if you ever find yourself uh, doing these kind of measurements. OK, so now that we can precisely and accurately measure thermal emission spectra, even for non-equilibrium emitters, um, what are the interesting things that we can do with this ability? So we spend all this time building all of this experimental uh, capability. What can we do? And uh, the first uh, 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 kind of application that I want to show you is something that we dubbed depth thermography. And the idea here is that we can try to measure temperatures not just at the surface of an object, which is how infrared thermography with uh, forehead thermometers like this one, if you can see it, and uh, infrared cameras work. Um, the, all of those techniques measure typically the surface temperature. And here we can try to find a way to measure temperatures beneath the surfaces of objects inside volumes. So the idea here is that if you have an object that has a gradient temperature, in other words, a temperature over here on the surface may be a little colder, the temperature underneath is maybe a little bit hotter, this is actually a potentially a non-equilibrium thermal emitter. And I say non-equilibrium because not all of the thermal emitter are at the same temperature. So if you have an object that's emitting from the surface and from some region below the surface, uh, which will happen if, um, your material is semi-transparent to infrared light, then you have this non-equilibrium thermal emitter, right? So your temperature is not well-defined because you have many temperatures and your emissivity is not necessarily well-defined. But what you can do in these circumstances is you can measure the spectrum of thermal radiation. And if you can do that very well, you can try to use computational techniques to retrieve the temperature as a function of depth. Because for example, the thermal radiation from the surface is going to have a different spectral, uh, is going to have a different spectrum than the thermal radiation from beneath the surface, not only because the temperatures are different, but because the, uh, the sample is necessarily going to have some optical losses that are wavelength dependent, and therefore the spectrum of light that comes out is going to have different spectral content if it comes from the depth of the surface, then from the uh, from the top uh, from the depth of the object, then from the surface of the object. And so this is potentially an exciting opportunity to do some computational work and to retrieve the underlying temperatures. So uh, this is from a publication from, uh, uh, from last year. So the way that we demonstrated this is uh, using a very kind of simple setup. So we have a heater stage over here. We control the temperature of our sample. And we have a sample that is relatively thick. In this case, it's one millimeter thick. And again, it's this few silica wafer. The reason why we use the few silica is because, first of all, it's semi-transparent in the relevant uh, wavelength range. So you can see that between, for example, three and eight microns, the penetration depth uh, is uh, you know, on the order of one millimeter, but also changes with wavelength, which is important important for us to be able to extract useful information. Um, and it also has relatively low thermal conductivity, which means that we can expect to see, even in this simple geometry, a temperature gradient from the top uh, surface to the bottom surface, uh, because, uh, because you're going to have a temperature drop uh, due to this relatively low thermal conductivity. And so this is the very simple setup and sample that we use to be able to do uh, demonstrate this thermal uh, 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 kind of thermal imaging, if you like, or, th uh, uh, or thermal characterization as a function of depth. And the idea here is to be able to figure out what is the surface temperature, what is the temperature you know, uh, 100 microns in, what is the temperature 200 microns in, and so forth, just from a simple uh, thermal emission measurement. And so this is what we did. So here is kind of the, the basic idea computationally. We can take the sample, which is the same material everywhere, and we can break it up into many different layers. This is kind of a discretization of the sample. Essentially, we can assume that each one of these layers has a slightly different temperature. And our task here is to figure out what each one of these temperatures is. Right. So here's the experiment. So this is the measured spectral radiance after all of the calibration versus wavelength. And the real data, this experiment when the temperature stage is at 300 degrees Celsius, is the red curve over here. Now, 
Overlaid with this red curve over here are two other curves. It might be hard for you to see because they really fall on top of each other. If you zoom into this region over here, you see that there's this red experimental curve, but there's also this black curve and this blue curve, and these are theoretical fits to the data. So the blue curve is a fit assuming a uniform temperature, just finding the best fit temperature. It turns out that the best fit temperature here is about 283 degrees Celsius because, of course, there's, again, this temperature drop from the bottom to the top, and you can see that we can fit the experimental data uh, extremely well. So this is uh, actually already quite, um, quite impressive uh, experimentally. But if you zoom into this region, remember that at wavelength ranges below about eight microns, you start to have the semi-transparency in the fusilica sample. You can see that the, um, the best fit for uniform temperatures doesn't exactly match the experimental data. There's this, uh, uh, there's this delta over here, and you might imagine that this is just an experimental error, but it's actually not because the fit is really, really good over here at long longer wavelengths. And so what it turns out is that the reason for this discrepancy over here between the uniform temperature theory or the uniform temperature fit and the experimental data is the fact that the temperature here is not the same as the temperature here. And therefore, you can't make this uniform temperature assumption and apply the simple form of uh, Planck's law and be able to fit the data. And so what we do is we, uh, we essentially uh, have a, a, a forward simulation that we perform based on the fluctuation dissipation theorem that can take Take in any set of these discrete temperatures and figure out what the resulting spectrum is going to be. And then we fit that model. So we are essentially fitting all of these individual temperatures and to uh, try to match the experimental spectrum as, as well as possible. And then ultimately, we're able to do this and we're able to get a measurement of the temperature as a function of depth. So this is exactly depth thermography. So this green line over here is what we expected the temperature to be. In this case, we expect it to be just a simple linear drop, uh, really just four years long. Of thermal, uh, of thermal conduction. The thermal radiation actually uh, only has a, a relatively small component uh, inside the material, and therefore we expect the, uh, the temperature versus depth to just be a straight line. And it, actually, it is. So if we assume a linear relationship, we can extract this uh, line almost perfectly. And if we don't assume a linear relationship, if we just let these temperatures float arbitrarily and we fit them individually, we get this relationship that also falls on this line, um, although it's not exactly perfect. Part of this is some some experimental and computation error. And part of this is because in reality, the temperature as a function of depth is not exactly linear in this, uh, in this situation either. And so we might be capturing some of that just a little bit. Now, I should say that uh, even though this is a very compelling and interesting technique, it does have significant drawbacks. So it requires this very precise and careful um, and accurate calibration that I talked about before. It also requires a system that has pretty good signal to noise and requires knowledge of the optical properties of the materials. Although I think this limitation can be overcome by, for example, doing these measurements as a function of angle and as a function of polarization and doing something akin to spectroscopic ellipsometry where you're getting more and more information about the, uh, the sample um, uh, because you have more kind of degrees of freedom in your measurement. So I think some of these issues can be overcome. And I'm particularly excited about the possibility of doing kind of imaging depth thermography where you can really uh, measure the temperature through three-dimensional volumes, uh, not just of solid state materials, but also of things like uh, volumes of gases, uh, high temperature gases, um, of uh, high temperature liquids like molten salts and so forth. Uh, so I think there's a lot of applications to this kind of depth thermography technique for non-contact remote sensing of temperatures throughout volumes. Okay. So um, the second uh, kind of measurement of thermal radiation example that I want to uh, give you is um, quite interesting because so far in this talk, all of the measurements have used a Fourier transform spectrometer or an FTIR, which is a common instrument for infrared measurements and has this kind of uh, uh, this kind of schematic, right, where you have an interferometer with a moving mirror and you're uh, and you're measuring uh, the spectrum of thermal radiation because of this tunable interference phenomena, tunable by this uh, moving mirror. So you're essentially um, tuning the interference condition. And in fact, all existing spectrometers, at least ones that I know of, uh, including FTIRs, use some sort of optics to achieve spectral selectivity. So that can mean gratings or prisms and kind of conventional grading or prism spectrometers. It can um, include interferometers with moving mirrors like FTIRs and other type of uh, interferometer, tunable interferometers. It can include uh, tunable filters with filter wheels and arrays. So for example, here is an example of a, of a spectrometer that uses kind of a tunable Fabry-Perot filter. You can imagine some more complex 
complicated um, interference uh, optics like uh, scattering type spectrometers. There's lots of different uh, approaches in the literature, but all of them use some optics to achieve spectral uh, selectivity. And what I'm going to show you is that thermal radiation can be used to build a spectroscopy technique that doesn't have any optical components that actually give you the spectral selectivity. You don't need any of them. And so uh, this is a kind of a compelling concept of doing spectroscopy really without having a spectrometer. So the way that we do this uh, is a technique that we called Planck spectroscopy. Essentially, thermal radiation gives us the ability to do spectroscopy without any kind of wavelength discriminating optical components. And the basic setup, kind of the most simple version of this, is exceedingly simple. You take a sample, you put it on a heat stage, and you have a detector over here, and you're measuring the thermal radiation as a function of temperature on the heat stage, and that's all you need to do in terms of a measurement, and you can recover the relevant spectra of the sample and of the light that's being emitted by the sample. So how do we do this? So the basic idea is kind of schematically shown over here. Your sample is going to have some wavelength dependent spectral emissivity, right? Either the emissivity could be flat, uh, although that's unlikely. Um, the emissivity could, you know, have a peak at some wavelength, have an increase and a decrease, or it could have a dip. It could be, you know, any, any sort of function uh, that's bounded by zero and one as a function of wavelength. And the actual spectrum of thermal radiation that's given off the sample when the sample is at some temperature is not only this emissivity, but it's this emissivity multiplied by the Planck's, uh, the Planck distribution, the Planck's law of thermal radiation. Here I'm normalizing Planck law, all of them to one. In reality, of course, the hotter the object is, the, more, the bigger the, uh, the spectral radiance is going to be. But so you take this emissivity and you multiply it by the um, uh, by the Planck distribution. Of course, you integrate the whole thing because your detector is not measuring a spectrum, it's just measuring the integrated power. And what you get then is the power versus the temperature of, um, of the sample. So the measured power on the detector versus the temperature on the sample. And in this case, I'm also normalizing the power by T to the fourth so that everything, all of these kind of fall uh, on top of each other. And one thing that you can see is that different spectra of the emissivity map to different shapes of the thermally emitted power, essentially because the spectrum multiplies by the, uh, the, the Planck distribution and the Planck distribution changes with temperature. And so you have this kind of non-trivial dependence of the thermally emitted power that's measured on the detector versus the sample temperature. And you can imagine inverting this, going from the measured power versus temperature to figuring out what the emissivity is using computational techniques. And that's what Planck spectroscopy is and how it works. So let me show you experimentally um, how we actually do this. So we take this temperature stage and put the sample here. We also put a reference here in this case. And we, again, it's one of these laboratory black bodies with vertically oriented carbon nanotubes. And what we do is we measure the voltage that the detector is outputting. So in this case, it's just in volts. I'm just normalizing the data over here versus the temperature of your sample. And uh, this is the ex experimental data that we acquired. So this is the, for the black body. This is for a piece of sapphire, a piece of fused silica, and a couple of samples of doped silica for different doping densities, essentially just different samples with different emissivities. And you can see that each one of these curves is quite different, right, in terms of its spectral shape. It's not too different, so you can imagine the kind of going back, going backwards to figure out the emissivity spectrum is not easy, but they are different, and so it is possible. And of course, the black body has the highest emissivity, and so it's on top. In this case, the doped silicon at high densities is the closest to being kind of metallic across the whole, uh, across the whole wavelength range, and so it has a the lowest emissivity over here. So here's uh, the experimental results. So we take this data and we uh, apply a, an inverse algorithm to try to figure out kind of the best fit to the emissivity. And so the first thing we do is we actually want to figure out our system response, which really just means the responsivity of our detector multiplied by the transmittance of the lens. And so what we do is we put this black body here with some emissivity we already know. We do the measurement and we figure out from that the responsivity of the setup, mainly just the detector response. So this is the detector response versus wavelength. Length, and you can see the, um, uh, the, the dots over here, the circles, is what we end up measuring and extracting. And the, uh, the solid line, which we call provided, is really just the spec of the detector. So we take the detector spec, what the detector responsivity should be versus the wavelength, 
and we multiply it by the transmission spectrum of the lens, and that's what this provided spectrum is. And so already you can see that we can measure the responsivity of the detector, the spectral responsivity, without using any sort of conventional spectrometer, prisms, gratings, and so forth. So that's already kind of a cool result. But then we take this responsivity together with this experimental data, and we can measure the emissivity of a bunch of reference samples just to see how it works. So here we have a piece of sapphire, a sapphire wafer, a fused silica wafer, a wafer of doped silicon uh, doped to 10 to the 20 uh, inverse uh, centimeter cubed using uh, ion implantation and annealing. And here it's also a doped silicon wafer, but doped to 10 to the 21 uh, inverse centimeter cubed. And you can see that uh, actually the results are quite good. So the solid lines over here are what we call kind of the actual emissivity spectrum. So we measure that using our Fourier transform spectrometer, kind of like I was showing you earlier. And then the circles are what we measure using Planck spectroscopy, again, without any sort of wavelength discriminating optics. And you can see it works quite well. So essentially across this entire range, we have a spectral resolution that looks something like one micron, and we're able to pick up all of these features quite well. So I think to my knowledge, this is the first ever kind of spectroscopy technique that that doesn't use any wavelength discriminating optics at all. And you can find this result posted on archive just uh, about a, a month ago and it's currently in peer review. So we were quite excited about this, um, this result. Um, I should mention that there is an alternative implementation of Planck spectroscopy that's possible, although we haven't demonstrated it experimentally yet, where instead of looking at thermal emission from the sample itself, you can look at thermal emission from a reference. So you can have a temperature stage over here that changes the temperature of the reference. You can send that light to the sample and look at the reflection or the transmission through the sample. And that enables you to handle uh, samples that um, are cold, that don't emit very much, or that are, have temperature dependent emissivity. Um, you can also use this, of course, to acquire reflectance or transmittance spectra, which might be useful. And by positioning some tunable polarizers over here, you can also do something that approximates spectroscopic ellipsometry or variable angle spectroscopic ellipsometry, again, without using any wavelength discriminating optical components like uh, tunable uh, Michelson interferometers with, a, with a, a moving mirror or a grading spectrometer or anything like that. So this is kind of a, a different, uh, more sophisticated implementation of Planck spectroscopy. Okay, so now I want to change gears a little bit and talk about engineering of thermal emission rather than measurement of thermal emission. So remember that the spectrum and intensity of thermal uh, radiation emitted by an object is governed by this Planck's law, and we have this emissivity correction over here. And remember that the emissivity can depend on many different things like wavelength and polarization and emission angle and so forth. And it's interesting to consider uh, a situation where objects have a emissivity that's temperature dependent. So essentially you have an absorptivity that's temperature dependent and therefore an emissivity that's temperature dependent. And in that case, you have kind of a very strange situation where your temperature dependence comes in not only in the black body contribution over here, but also in your emissivity, um, which is, becomes temperature dependent. And so you can imagine situations that are very anomalous. Like for example, uh, maybe this term goes up with temperature, but this term goes down with temperature. And what does that mean for the total thermal radiation that is actually being emitted from this kind of object? And if you want to do this, if you want to be able to do this kind of engineering, you need materials with temperature tunable optical properties. So essentially, you need materials that was a complex refractive index changes a lot with temperature. And so what we've been uh, using for, uh, uh, for as a kind of a building block for these kind of thermal radiators uh, is a class of materials that undergo insulator to metal phase transitions. And the most famous example of this is vanadium dioxide. So VO2 is a metal oxide that's been known since about 1960 or 1961 to undergo a phase transition when you heat it past about 70 degrees Celsius. And this is a reversible transition, but with a hysteresis. And this is a very dramatic phase transition in that, for example, the DC resistance changes by four orders of magnitude across this transition. And you can, of course, go back and forth many times. The crystal structure changes, the band structure changes completely. And so this very large on-off ratio in this material is highly desirable for um, switching applications and electronics and, and optics and so forth. And I should say that all of our work in VO2 has been in collaboration with uh, Sherman Armanathan's group at Purdue, but also we have collaborations with Physical Sciences Incorporated and, and, and others in this um, uh, in this area. And so one thing that we uh, did over the last couple of years is we uh, spent some time analyzing the complex refractive index of VO2. Now, if you go in the literature, you'll find decades of papers applying all sorts of spectroscopy techniques and plotting and reporting the complex refractive index of VO2 in various wavelength ranges. But it turned out that there wasn't really a comprehensive resource that gives you the uh, the temperature dependent complex refractive index uh, across a broad uh, wavelength range, for example, from the UV to the um, 
far infrared, and then also uh, that analyzed how uh, uh, how sample dependent is this uh, complex refractive index. So if you deposit a sample, uh, deposit a film of VO2 using a sputter coder versus a PLD system versus an ALD system, how different is the resulting film going to be? And so this is something that we decided to study because of course it's very important for applications. And here are the results. So this is the complex refractive index below the phase transition temperature and above the phase transition temperature all the way from the UV all the way to the far infrared for wavelengths from 0.2 microns to about 30 microns. And this is done with a pair of spectroscopic ellipsometers. And you can see a few interesting features. One is that, of course, you have this enormous change in the optical properties, which, and, uh, in other words, kind of in the mid-infrared, VO2 transitions from being kind of a transparent dielectric, more or less, to being a lossy dielectric, to being kind of a lossy metal. And therefore, it has all of these uh, potential uses as a tunable optical material, provided that the, the loss that's present can be utilized. But one thing that we found that was quite exciting is there is a special region between about two microns and 11 microns away from interband resonances and also vibrational resonances where the losses in at least the insulating state are quite low. And so you can use this uh, material even for some more conventional type of optics, not necessarily even thermal emitters. And um, as long as you're within this wavelength range, you have at least one phase that's relatively low loss. And therefore um, you can use it, for example, for transmission type optics. Um, I should point out that this paper that we published in 2019, if you go to the supplementary information, we have tables upon tables of data sets that you can just copy and paste into your FDTD simulations and thin film calculations and FEM calculation simulations and so forth. And so these data sets of, uh, of uh, VO2 are available for, uh, for public consumption and public use. Um, we think that they're very useful for uh, optical design. So one thing that we found that was interesting is that um, we spent some time figuring out the dependence of the complex refractive index on the deposition conditions and on the substrates. So if you look in the literature again, you find that even in the same wavelength ranges, VO2 complex refractive index differs dramatically from sample to sample and group to group. And this is very strange and also it's very inconvenient because it means if you ever do VO2, make VO2 devices yourself, you have to characterize your own materials from scratch. And so what we found is that the complex refractive index of VO2 changes dramatically depending on the deposition technique, whether you sputter or do sol gel synthesis, for example, or whether you have you deposited on silicon versus sapphire because there's an epitaxial relationship between the uh, the film and the substrate, but there is this magic range, and again, it's this two to eleven micron range where uh, the uh, where the deposition conditions don't seem to matter too much, and the complex refractive index is more or less the same. So over here in the visible, for example, you have big differences in the mid in the far infrared. You have big differences, but in this magic two to eleven range, which is again away from the resonances both um, on the short wavelength side and on the long wavelength side, the VO2 is roughly sample independent as far as its optical properties go. And that's really important for applications. It means that if you make devices in these uh, kind of mid infrared wavelength range, then you can be reasonably confident that you can use other people's optical properties and you don't have to recharacterize your own, uh, your own VO2 samples. So I think that's very useful. Okay, so another uh, uh, category of materials that we use for uh, temperature tunable uh, thermal emission engineering is um, uh, Nicolates. Actually, there is really a zoo of complex oxides and nicolates with insulator to metal phase transitions. You can see just a, a handful of them here from this review article from our Purdue collaborators. And the transitions occur at different temperatures. And most of them have to do with some sort of MOT, uh, MOT physics where you break a MOT insulator state. And here's an example of a, another one of these materials. This is samarium nickel oxide or samarium nicolate. And here's the real and imaginary part of the refractive index as a function of temperature, which we measured uh, again with spectroscopic ellipsometry. And you can see this very large change in optical properties, which is quite exciting for tunable optics. But unlike VO2, there is no zero loss or low loss state. And therefore, you know, this is very useful for thermal emission engineering, maybe less useful for some conventional transmission type optics. Uh, but you have to understand your material before you, uh, before you try to use it for uh, devices. So uh, let me show you some examples of using uh, some of these materials for thermal emission engineering. So here is a result. This is the only result that I have that's still from my graduate work um, when I was a graduate student. Uh, so from 2013, uh, the last uh, couple of years of, uh, of uh, my PhD um, in Federico Capasso's group. And this is uh, before we understood how to do these measurements very well. So you find that the emitted power is in arbitrary units. And before we knew you know, all of these details of the optical properties of VO2. But nevertheless, we we're able to get this kind 
a preliminary result, which is just to have thin a film 150 nanometers of VO2 on a sapphire wafer. And we just measure the thermally emitted power versus temperature from the structure. And here, this is integrated over the 8 to 14 micron window, uh, where the atmosphere is typically transparent. It's a very kind of famous long wave infrared window in infrared optics. And so the emitted power versus temperature looks like this for a black body, but has this local maximum in emitted power for the VO2 and sapphire sample, and has this region over here where the emitted power goes down with temperature. So this is quite strange, right? Normally you expect um, thermal emitters uh, or any objects as you heat up, uh, as you heat them up to emit more and more light. And here, as you heat it up, it emits less and less light over this region where you have this phase transition. And of course, you also have a hysteresis associated with it because there is a hysteresis that's intrinsic to the phase transition of VO2. And this is quite a striking result. So we took a commercial off the shelf mid infrared camera and pointed it at, at the sample at different temperatures. And you can see that as you increase the temperature, the sample looks like that it's getting hotter in the camera. And then you increase the temperature some more, and it looks like the sample is getting colder, even though in reality it's getting hotter. And it, this is happening because of this negative differential effect. The reason we call it negative differential is because the derivative over here of this power versus temperature curve is negative. And so we thought this was uh, very compelling, um, both conceptually and also for applications and kind of thermoregulation and, and infrared, uh, you know, kind of privacy applications and so forth. Um, so you might notice that this uh, happens exactly at a wavelength at a temperature of about 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's where the phase transition of v intrinsic VO2 is. Now there are known ways in the literature to tune uh, the phase transition of VO2 by alloying with um, various materials. We discovered a new way to, to uh, tune the, the phase transition of VO2 uh, published in 2016 uh, to get jointly with Karsten Running's group at the University of Vienna in Germany. And in this case, what we discovered is that the ion beam bombardment of VO2 can lead to a significant change of the transition temperature. You can see that the same feature um, in all of these reflectance curves uh, occur at very different temperatures from 70 degrees at the phase transition for intrinsic, the intrinsic material all the way down to room temperature. And um, this is because uh, the ion irradiation, ion bombardment actually uh, results in defects which uh, cause strain in the material and strain is known to be one of the factors that can uh, decrease the phase transition temperature of VO2. And uh, so you can uh, you know, use any sort of ion beam here, we use cesium or argon or various types of ions to just kind of damage the film intentionally a little bit. And that doesn't change the optical properties too much, but it does change the transition temperature a lot. And so we can then move around the peak of uh, and the, the, the region where you have this negative differential effect uh, on this plot. So uh, we thought that was kind of a compelling, uh, compelling method uh, using ion beams. So, Okay, so now that we can do this, now that we can have a, a region of negative differential thermal emittance, we had this goal um, when uh, I was starting out at UW-Madison to create a thermal emitter that has a many to one relationship between temperature and thermally emitted power. Essentially, instead of each temperature mapping to a different power, here, I want each temperature, uh, each temperature over some temperature range to all map to the same power. In other words, have a zero differential thermal emitter, because I think this would be very interesting for concealing uh, kind of thermal radiation, concealing information that's provided in thermal radiation for kind of infrared privacy applications. Um, so uh, you can imagine that infrared cameras are going to become more and more uh, commercially accessible and cheaper and more ubiquitous, and you want to have a way to try to conceal some information from them as kind of a, a, a countermeasure, if you like. So the idea here would be that the thermally emitted power here, it's integrated over, over the uh, relevant wavelength range versus temperature. Instead of increasing with temperature, it's just a, a, a constant line and therefore has a zero derivative. And so the only way to do that is to have this emissivity that's uh, temperature dependent in just the right way so that the uh, this curve uh, so so that the power um, it remains constant. Therefore, this total emissivity needs to have roughly a temperature to the minus fourth dependence. It's not exactly true because you're, you're in some cases, you're limited to a finite wavelength range, but roughly speaking, this needs to be one over t to the fourth. And fortunately, we were able to do just that um, with a, uh, a thin film of samarium nickel oxide, one of this, uh, uh, this nickelate material that I showed you just a few slides ago on top of a sapphire wafer. Here's a measurement that we did. This is the emiss spectral emissivity versus wavelength versus temperature. Uh, measured using a couple of different approaches via the direct emission measurements that uh, using our calibrated system and also using Kirchhoff's law of thermal radiation based on our ellipsometry data. And you can see that the emissivity 
at all of these wavelengths in the long wave atmospheric transparency window gradually decreases with temperature, which is exactly what you need. And in fact, it turns out that this decrease is at just the right pace to achieve the zero differential effect. So to see that, we integrate the spectrum, uh, we integrate the thermal emission spectrum over eight to 14 microns, and we plot the, the, rate, the integrated radiance versus temperature. And you can see that over here, uh, between about 100 uh, degrees Celsius and 135 degrees Celsius, you have this uh, zero slope, the zero differential effect, which means that irrespective of the temperature, your amount of thermally radiated power is the same. And so we've achieved our goal. And this is um, quite striking visually. So what we did over here is we took our sample and we mounted it with Kapton tape to hang off a heater stage. This is like a top view. So essentially the sample is at 130 degrees here, but it's at a lower temperature over here just because there's this temperature gradient. The sample is just kind of hanging off in air. And so if you have a typical sample, not a zero differential thermal emitter, in this case, just a piece of sapphire, you see that you have a, uh, a region that's hot over here and it's emitting more thermal radiation and a region that's colder over here and it's emitting less thermal radiation and a gradient in between. But this gradient is completely invisible on the zero differential sample because um, you are uh, because the essentially, even though the temperature over here is lower than here, the emissivity is higher. And so this emissivity gradient that forms naturally cancels out the temperature gradient to give you kind of the same image everywhere. And so this is a way to conceal information. So um, we're potentially excited about this for kind of privacy and shielding type applications. So for example, here is a train carrying some sort of uh, radioactive material that's heating up inside. And so if you uh, put, uh, you, you cover it with this kind of coating, you can imagine, this is just a mock-up that I made uh, in PowerPoint, but you can imagine uh, having a, all of these uh, temperature features Features, spatially dependent features of thermal emission become, uh, become just a, a constant and you lose the ability to gain information about the temperature distribution of the underlying object. And so this was published in PNAS um, in 2019. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about in my last few minutes is uh, thermal radiation uh, engineering with temperature, uh, sorry, this is a mistake, with time dependent emissivity, I apologize. So. Um, if you want to modulate thermal emission in time, not, not temperature, in time, then typically what you want to do is you want to change the temperature with time, right? So if you want to, for example, take an incandescent light bulb and turn it on and off, what you would do is you would heat it up and then cool it back down again. And this process can be quite slow because essentially of heat capacity of the objects and finite thermal conductivity and things like that. So if you want to be able to turn on a thermal source very fast, maybe on a nanosecond or picosecond time scale, typically you can't do that just because of thermal time constants, even of very kind of thin, low heat capacity structures are still, generally speaking, not going to be better than you know, microseconds or tens of microseconds. Alternatively, a way that we can tune the thermal emission as a function of time is we can make the emissivity be time dependent. And the emissivity is not constrained uh, to the, the, the time scale of, uh, of the thermal processes in the system. So you can make something that, um, uh, that uh, where the emissivity changes very, very quickly. And this is potentially a different way to, for example, make infrared optical pulses. You can imagine emissivity that's very low, and then all of a sudden it's very high, and then it's very low again, and, and a, a pulse comes out of infrared light. And this is quite an unconventional way Way to make infrared optical pulses very different than nonlinear optics, which is, uh, you know, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the the terahertz pulse generation that uh, Yuan Mu talked about in the in the previous talk. So it's interesting to try to do this. So this is a collaboration that we had with Alberto Piquet's group at the Naval Research Lab, and the idea here it's actually a very simple experimental setup is you have the sample over here again on a heater stage, so you can heat it up. And the sample is just a undoped piece of semiconductor. So either silicon or gallium arsenide or something else. And in uh, both of those cases for silicon and gallium arsenide, the, um, the wafers that are undoped, they don't emit very much. The emissivity is very close to zero starting out. And what you do then is you hit the sample. So you hit this gallium arsenide wafer or the silicon wafer with a pump pulse. So essentially here it's a, uh, a pulse at a wavelength that's much uh, shorter than the, uh, the, the, get, the band gap of the material. Therefore you can easily absorb this incident pump pulse. And it's very short here. It's just hundreds of femtoseconds. Uh, and it's just a green pulse. And then you take a look at the thermal radiation that's being given off with a fast mid infrared detector. Here we have a kind of a one nanosecond uh, time scale uh, 
uh, mid infrared detector that detects from three to 11 microns. And what, here's what we measure. So essentially here's the power that's measured by the detector as a function of time, where over here is when the optical pulse, the, the visible pulse hits the sample. And so you can see that this is the mid infrared optical power measured by this detector for a wafer of gallium arsenide just sitting at a temperature of 200 degrees for different um, different powers of your pump laser. And you can see that you have this kind of nanosecond scale uh, uh, infrared pulse that's being thermally emitted. And so the reason this works is because the emissivity starts out being close to zero. It's an undoped piece of gallium arsenide. You hit this thing with a, a pump pulse in the visible, it generates a lot of free carriers. Your emissivity goes up substantially, right? Because you're generating all these free carriers. Essentially, the sample becomes kind of like a, a lossy dielectric or a lossy metal, and you have high emissivity and therefore a significant thermal emission that comes off. And then very quickly, the free carriers recombine, right? You have a recombination process that an undoped gallium arsenide is on the nanosecond time scale, and then you have this uh, uh, th this tail over here, which tells you the recombination uh, time scale, and therefore you have this mid infrared optical pulse that is about uh, you know a couple of nanoseconds in uh, in duration. And so, to my knowledge, this is, uh, or at least as of 2019, this is the fastest ever modulation of the emissivity by something like a factor of a thousand. So the fastest ever modulation of emissivity that I know of before is from uh, uh, the Noda group in um, in Japan, uh, where they uh, they electrically modulate. Um, the, uh, the emissivity of a quantum well system. Here, because we're modulating it optically, we can do it much, much faster, uh, in this case, on a nanosecond time scale. Um, and this is, again, a very interesting kind of unique way of generating infrared pulses from visible pulses that doesn't use conventional nonlinear optical techniques. And this work was published in, um, in 2019. Okay. So uh, I'm going to finish up uh, with just uh, my outline slide, which is also my summary slide. So we spent some time uh, kind of introducing thermal radiation as a concept and talking about the various uh, difficulties that you might encounter in the lab about measuring thermal radiation, especially under challenging conditions like low temperature or non-equilibrium conditions and so forth. Um, I introduced two new techniques using thermal radiation. Um, one of them is depth thermography, which is a technique to measure the temperature beneath the surfaces of materials. And one is Planck spectroscopy, which is a, a, a way of doing spectroscopy without using any wavelength discriminating optical components. So kind of spectroscopy without a spectrometer, if you like. And then we spent some time talking about the engineering of thermal emissivity using temperature, sorry, using temperature tunable optical materials, so uh, which enabled us to make the zero differential thermal emitter, and then also time dependent optical properties, which gave us the fastest ever temporal control of thermal emissivity of materials. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions and thank you so much. And thank you again to Alice uh, for having me uh, here for the panel discussion and uh, this talk. It's really a, a wonderful um, series open to, uh, open to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, you really great the talk and uh, you are the next speaker can compete with Professor John Rogers for this, you know, speech. Yeah, so how fast it can be, it can run, yeah. So very nice. There are a few questions to come out. The first is uh, Professor Katz. You gave uh, examples of a uh, uh, fused silica. Did you test the other materials, especially polymers for soft electronics? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So our, uh, you notice that we, we used a lot of kind of very simple materials in this talk, mm -hmm. at least in part of it. Fused silica, sapphire, doped silicon, gallium arsenide, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, the reason is because, of course, those materials are very well known, and we're quite focused on technique development, trying to, so in trying to characterize our techniques, we want to use very known uh, materials with, with uh, relatively known optical properties. Um, so uh, we certainly studied some soft materials. For example, we've measured the emissivity of, uh, of PDMS, and that's very useful for uh, radiative cooling applications. So um, uh, my, my, my slides are, are gone now, but for example, we have a uh, a preprint on archive uh, led, uh, that we collaborated on, uh, led by Zongfu Yu's group at, here at UW Madison, where uh, we used PDMS based thermal radiators to um, achieve passive radiative cooling and vapor condensation. So, essentially, uh, take advantage of kind of the cold temperature of the universe in the upper atmosphere to cool down uh, a surface and to achieve, um, uh, uh, to achieve uh, enhanced vapor condensation rates. So, 
essentially harvest water from, uh, from water vapor. Um, we haven't done too much uh, analysis of polymers for soft electronics, but of course the techniques are perfectly applicable to uh, understanding um, the optical properties, especially in the mid infrared. I think probably most applications of soft electronics and optical electronics are uh, would be in the visible and near infrared. But um, I think as these infrared technologies become more mature, um, I think uh, the mid infrared optical properties will be important as well. And of course, all of these techniques will be applicable to polymers. Okay, super. Now many many people was moving to this direction, so there should be you know a lot of. Uh, uh, applications in this area, so I think it's important for to do something. Yeah, the second question is pretty long. Okay, you mentioned that the depth thermography, which is very interesting. I noticed that the measurement is a spectral readings that didn't have a planetary, you know, coordinates. Is this thermography same possible to be three D? Meaning, could it be possible to also have a resolution in the X Y plan that is as sensitive as in the Z direction? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. So um, certainly, our technique is you know at the moment just uh, at one at one uh, X Y point as a function of depth, right? So it's it's not three dimensional um, because we have uh, just you know one spectrometer and we're looking at one spectrum. Um, you can make it three D by raster scanning your sample, right? By moving your sample uh, one, one, one point at a time uh, and, uh, and getting a, a 3D volume that way. That's of course very slow and not very, uh, probably not very efficient. Um, we are very excited about the possibility of doing this volumetric, uh, volumetric depth thermography, which is exactly, I think the point of your question, especially in uh, high temperature gases and three and uh, high temperature liquids, where it's very difficult to measure temperatures any other way. Your probes get destroyed by the high temperatures. Um, and the way to do that, I think, would be to use a uh, focal plane arrays, right? So instead of having a spectrometer that's kind of a single point spectrometer, you would have an imaging spectrometer like a, like a hyperspectral camera um, uh, or a um, uh, or, or, or an FTIR with a, with a focal plane array, and those are certainly available. Um, they're expensive, and we don't have one in our lab, um, but uh, that's that's very possible. Um, I also think that it would be interesting to apply some of the depth thermography techniques to try to um, computationally get some of this data. So use just a conventional mid infrared camera, which is quite inexpensive these days, and try to not really have a real spectrometer, um, but I think that's quite difficult because probably our Planck spectroscopy technique is not quite good enough at acquiring a spectrum at a sufficient resolution and sufficient um, uh, and sufficient precision and accuracy to be able to do depth thermography. So I don't think these two techniques have quite fused yet, but you can imagine them fusing and then uh, giving you the ability to do this volumetric imaging even without these very expensive hyperspectral mid-infrared cameras. So yeah, this is a very insightful question. Okay, great. Yeah, next time we can hear some story about 3D. Okay, the next question is very nice work. And the plant spectroscopy work, what's the fundamental limitation of the spectral resolution? So there is no fundamental limit. And what I mean by that is you don't have like a diffraction limit for, for the, the spectral uh, uh, oh, sorry, actually, I, I guess I misunderstood the question slightly. So the spectral resolution, of course, is the resolution of the measurement, right, itself. I'm assuming that what the question is asking is what's, what's the limitation of either the, the, the temperature resolution, how well you can resolve the temperature, or what's the resolution spatially, like how well can you localize the different temperatures and, and uh, you know, and there's no fundamental limit to either of those. There is of course a fundamental limit to the XY localization, which is the diffraction limit. So that's kind of from the previous question. However, just because there is no fundamental limitation doesn't mean that there is no limitation. In fact, there's very substantial limitations. Um, this problem of inverting the spectrum to get a temperature versus depth is actually quite poorly conditioned. Um, it's a very difficult problem to do. And um, uh, essentially, you need a very, very high accuracy and very good precision of your uh, spectral measurement to be able to get a, an accurate and precise you know, temperature with high resolution in, in, in both the temperature resolution and the, 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 the spatial resolution in, in depth. And what we've found is that even 
with our quite sophisticated calibration, we can't, for example, get much better spatial resolution right now than, you know, a, 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 on the order of like 100 microns, something like that in, in depth. The better your experimental measurement is, the better your measurement of your spectrum, um, the better you'll be able to do and the better your computational algorithms. And again, there is no like, there's no hard ceiling. You can always do better, but the scaling is quite bad. So uh, I don't know what it is, but just because you can, for example, improve your resolution and precision and accuracy of your spectrum by a fact, spectroscopy by a factor of two, doesn't mean that you can improve your resolution of in depth uh, or in temperature by a factor of two. The scaling is um, not great. So I think. Um, this is a, a work in progress to try to do better and better with measurements, but um, also better and better with uh, with uh, computational algorithms. I think the best way to uh, do better and better and not run into this very poor scaling is to actually do the measurements with a bunch of different degrees of freedom. Instead of just in one direction, uh, maybe you tilt the angle a few times and do kind of ellipsometry type measurements, or you change the polarization. You want to try to get extra information, and then the computational algorithm will be able to do better. So um, I know that that's that's not that, that's not exactly the answer to your question, but that's kind of the flavor of um, of, of where we are. Okay, yeah, that's really good. You have uh, really no limitations. I think even from hardware and software, both sides can help, you know, to achieve higher. Yeah, I, I mean, I, sh I should again emphasize that having no full ceiling limitation does not mean that uh, the problem is, you know, well conditioned and you can keep improving it forever. I mean, there's, uh, there are certainly issues, but but I do think that a lot of improvements are possible. Okay, cool. Yeah, next question. The result of a VO2 on the surface of street are really exciting. Is that possible to appear on other substrates? Yeah, so I think there's two parts to this question um, that are kind of hidden. One of them is, is it possible to have VO2 on other substrates? And another one is, um, uh, you know, what what are the kind of potential applications, um, and, and and can you put it on all sorts of different uh, different structures that you might want to you know cool or heat or or uh, hide from infrared cameras and so forth. Um, so in terms of being able to uh, deposit it, um, uh, VO two uh, is a uh, a crystalline material, and you actually need the polycrystallinity at least to have a phase transition. So if you have amorphous material or you have kind of mixed valence vanadium oxide, you have no phase transition at all. In fact, the most common um, microbolometer technology in existing infrared cameras is uh, what's called VOX, mixed valence uh, vanadium oxide. And that has no phase transition at all. That's just a different material altogether, even though the, the, the chemical composition seems very similar. Um, so you do need some sort of, uh, in, in, in some cases, you need some sort of epitaxial relationship to your substrate when you grow the material. And so, for example, in sapphire, you have a really nice epitaxial relationship and you can grow it quite well. Um, however, and this is something that we kind of figured out uh, while well, uh, through the, the, the course of, of doing some of the research that I was showing earlier, um, you, uh, you can actually deposit VO2 on a lot of different substrates using sputtering or ALD and so forth, and still have very decent perf optical performance in the infrared, even as the electrical performance can be worse and worse. So I didn't show you this, but for example, our collaborators at Physical Sciences Incorporated used sol gel synthesis to deposit VO2 on different substrates, for example, silicon, when there is no real epitaxial relationship that's, or, you know, there's, there's a poor, uh, poor match of the, um, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, of the uh, uh, space between atoms. I, um, the, the, the word is uh, just flew out of my head for a second. Uh, and, st and if you measure the electronic property, so if you do like electrical transport measurements, it's not so good actually, if you compare, you know, uh, the VO2 film on sapphire under the right conditions to the cell gel synthesized filaments on silicon, it's much, much worse. So if you're looking for electronic applications, um, you, you might have issues. But for optics applications in the mid infrared, actually the optical properties are almost identical, which is quite amazing. Um, and that's because you don't need, for example, you know, conduction over, over long distances over, you know, for example, micro, you know, hundreds of microns or millimeters, you know, your, your carrier are moving not very far um, in response to your optical fields. And so um, it turns out that the optical properties kind of, again, in this magic 2 to 11 micron range are almost the same for 
uh, low quality VO2 as it is for high quality VO2. And that's really great because it means you can put it on a lot of different materials. But then on top of that, you actually don't need a very thick material underneath the VO2, uh, a very thick substrate to have this effect. So in principle, you, you, know, you could have thin film uh, you know, silicon or thin film sapphire if you, can, if you can manage to have those kind of substrates and put it on whatever you want. And so it actually really doesn't even matter what's underneath uh, the surface. And so there, there are multiple ways to apply this kind of technology to lots of different uh, systems and applications. Okay, I have a one question falling to this. How about the process temperature for your VO2? How is the thickness and temperature? Yeah, so I mean, we don't grow VO2 ourselves. So to some extent, I defer to our colleagues at Purdue who do uh, sputter synthesis um, and uh, our, our colleagues at uh, at Physical Sciences Incorporated who do cell gel synthesis. Typically, um, to crystallize VO2, you know, from some sort of precursor or from uh, sputter deposited material, you do need high temperatures, right? So you need something like four or 500 degrees Celsius to be able to, to, to crystallize it. There are um, lower temperature technologies is available. So um, I'm familiar with some attempts to do atomic layer deposition at lower temperatures, you know, just a couple hundred degrees. Um, but you do need a decent temperature to uh, some elevated temperature to be able to uh, form the VO2 crystal phase. And that is potentially a problem because especially if you want to incorporate it, uh, you know, the, the, the film of VO2 into other materials where you can't heat it up too much, whether it's because, you know, uh, the, it, maybe it's a polymer that just can't stand those temperatures or you have multiple different materials materials that uh, will result in like delamination because of thermal expansion coefficients and so forth. And so um, uh, I didn't show this result, but for example, we recently, uh, actually this paper isn't out yet, uh, but we recently teamed with uh, uh, Physical Sciences Incorporated to demonstrate the incorporation of a VO2 thin film into a complicated thin film assembly in the mid infrared, you know, many stacked thin films. And the way that we had to do that is you first put the VO2 film on a membrane, you, for, you form it under an appropriate temperature and then you grow all the other films afterward because you don't want to do this high temperature processing after the fact. So you definitely pointed out a significant limitation potentially, although I will say that ALD deposited films that we haven't used in our lab um, too much uh, do have the promise of uh, decreasing the process temperature. Okay, that's really great. Temperature always a big issue for this fabrication. Yeah. Okay, the next question is for the zero DTE. You know. Uh, did you have any discussions of the device's performance? Uh, for example, efficient, stability, lifetime, power consumption, etc. Yeah. So um, the uh, so I think some of these um, yes, and some of them I'm not sure that it entirely makes sense to talk about. So absolutely, stability and lifetime is critically important, right? You want to be able to. Uh, have this work for you know months and years, and uh, you wanted to be able to take many thermal cycles, right? So you're going back and forth in temperature, and the temperatures are non-trivial, right? Um, so uh, you want to make sure that things are stable. Um, we haven't done um, super rigorous studies on stability or lifetime, but I will say that um, some of the samples in our lab, we've been uh, uh, for kind of practical considerations, we've been uh, doing measurements on for years now, um, and the samples don't seem to be degrading. Um, so that that's good. We haven't done like really, really rigorous stability analysis. We haven't gone back and forth a million times, but you know, we've gone back and forth a number of times over a long period of time, and the samples seem to be stable um, not completely, but they seem to be. Um, and I, I think they can probably be stabilized even more with some additional process development. So the, uh, the samarium nickel oxide from our collaborators, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a newer and uh, less kind of established material than, for example, VO2 or, you know, some really, really conventional materials. And so I, I imagine you can, you can stabilize the material uh, much better. Um, efficiency and power consumption, I'm not sure that are um, super meaningful concepts here, right? Because the, the sample is kind of passive, right? Like it responds to its own temperature. So what does it mean for it to be efficient? Uh, there, you know, what does it mean for it to be power consuming? So I, I don't think those metrics um, are, are, are easy to define in this case. Okay, really great. I think the stability at the lifetime is more important than, than anything else. If you can make it, you know, yeah, like uh, zero. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's exactly good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, 
uh, you deliver very nice talk and uh, use your technology to connect the world and the universe. That's a certification for you. I hope I see you next time. I can deliver this certification to you in person. <laughs> I hope I hope so as well. I, I think I think the time is coming. And yeah, we're, we're certainly all is. hoping for it. Yeah. Thank you it so is. much, Alice, for 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 um, having me. It's uh, been a really wonderful pleasure, and it's a, also a wonderful pleasure to listen to um, or watch all the other Iconex talks. And thanks uh, to uh, Yuan Mu and uh, and Professor Jagadish from uh, for the excellent conversation earlier. Yeah, this is a shared place. So everyone, every Friday, we share all this. And uh, thank you very much. Next week. We're going to have a uh, Professor Jay Gu from uh, University of Michigan. Yeah, and uh, Yung An Huang was from uh, Huazhong University of Science and Technology. All of them uh, are going to talk the story of uh, manufacture. They use different methods. They all do a wonderful job for the advanced manufacture. So we're looking forward to next week. Uh, next week, uh, Professor Pavis will come back to the stage, and uh, we're going to, you know, have him to say the sunrise of uh, LA is uh, uh, four o'clock. So next week we'll have uh, Paul here, and we we'll have a uh, two wonderful speaker waiting for us. Yeah, I hope. Uh, really looking forward to see you next week. This was our group of uh, family uh pictures. Uh, I hope we can get more and more scientists. Uh, got into join this family and get on these pictures. Welcome everyone. And uh, this was all of today. I see you next Friday. I can act to talk to that world and the universe. See you.